see the Moses Kotana Institute. The Moses Kotana Institute is an institute of economic development, tourism, and environmental affairs in KwaZulu Natal. We are bringing you a Friday lecture on the impact of COVID-19 on uh, maritime business. With us, we have Dr. Ngobo, who is an academic, well, business time space, who is bringing you this um, a very vibrant uh, lecture. Uh, we are mandated as Moses Kotane to conduct research and development for the provincial province, uh, for the provincial government, uh, coordinate activities on uh, innovation and technology, as well as coordinate activities on maritime ec and economic. So um, the procedure for today is that I will hand over to Dr. Ngobo, who's going to give us a lecture for um, 30 minutes, and then we will take questions and answers. Uh, you are welcome to post your questions uh, at the bottom of your screen so that uh, we, we can uh, then uh, be able to answer you at the end of, of the lecture. Thank you, Dr. Ngobo, over to you. Uh, thank, thank you very much, uh, CEO. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to have this privilege uh, of uh, doing this lecture. Uh, of course, these are unusual times. Uh, we, of course, need to do everything possible to ensure our safety. And I think it's important to also acknowledge that uh, COVID uh, in South Africa has impacted many families and it's important that we continue to look after ourselves and we stay safe. My responsibility today is to talk to all of you about uh, the impact of COVID in the maritime industry. I have prepared a few slides, which I believe they are in front of you. Uh, right in front of you, there is a, a program in terms of some of the key topics that I'll be talking to. The first item, I'm gonna talk a bit about the maritime economy in South Africa talk about the global overview, some of the difficult challenges that we are all experiencing. I also want to talk about shipping and, and exports. Uh, I will talk about clearing and forwarding, shipbuilding and repair, uh, how COVID has impacted in that side of the business. I'll talk about oil and gas. Uh, I've got a few proposals in terms of official in Guadalupe Natal. I'll also talk about ports and terminals. Uh, I've got a few messages for Transnet. And then, of course, I will end with a few proposals uh, for consideration. Some of these proposals have already been communicated uh, with our government uh, as we speak. I hope everyone can see the presentation. The first slide uh, talks about uh, the maritime economy uh, in South Africa, which was uh, in an initiative as part of the Operation Patisa. There's a few strategic uh, areas that we identified in maritime transportation and manufacturing offshore oil and gas, aquaculture, marine protection services and ocean governance, small harbors and coastline development, coastline and maritime tourism skills development, and more importantly, research and technology, which in South Africa is, is mainly driven by uh, CGS uh, that's doing excellent work in terms of that. When Operation Patisa was started, there was a drive that it was believed that by 2030, uh, more than uh, a million jobs could be created uh, and the ocean economy could make a significant contribution up to 157 billion uh, of, of gross domestic product uh, by 2033. So this is a vision that was articulated. Uh, I do believe that we need to revisit this, this, this vision to ensure that we are able to progress going forward. The global overview in terms of where we are, in terms of the current uh, challenges, we are all aware that uh, early this year in January, the IMO in sulfur regulations uh, from the 1st of January, uh, which took a center stage. Uh, and of course, uh, four months later, we now have COVID, which has a significant impact in terms of the, the global uh, outlook. As we are all aware, the outlook of global economic growth remains very bleak. Uh, we anticipate that this is worse than uh, what SARS was able to do in 2002. I also believe it's worse than the 2009 global recession. The West Texas immediate uh, reference oil future drew some headlines uh, as it crashed into negative territory. The sliding oil prices have driven down Bangafuel. 
of course, it holds a, a very a mixed implications, especially for, for the shipping industry of which uh, I am part. And of course, the banker suppliers are, are quite a, a concern in terms of the demand that uh, it's been affected because of COVID. We've seen a report from the International Energy Agency that demand uh, has and will continue to be challenging going into the second quarter of this year. The massive supply demand imbalance has led to a steep uptick in terms of the crude oil stockpiling, which will continue to drag uh, on for quite a while, and it will have an impact uh, in demands going forward. It is also anticipated that the recovery is expected to be a low depth, uh, but of course there will be clear impact in terms of what is likely to happen going forward, depending on how long the COVID-19 will be with us. Impact on the shipping and uh, export, it's quite clear that uh, the commodity prices have been affected. I'm aware that only coal uh, seem to be surviving, uh, purely because there's no uh, local production in China. So coal export remains uh, quite exciting, but the rest of other commodities are being impacted by the COVID. We have seen that the international shipping industry which is responsible for almost 90% of the world trade has There's not been much trading, uh, especially uh, during the last uh, two months, uh, purely because of the current challenges. And in South Africa, it has had a significant impact, especially in the ports, and the fact that the mines have had to reduce uh, or stop production completely. We appreciate what the president has announced in allowing the mines to setting at 50%, of though 50% is still not sufficient, allowing us to continue to realize the maximum opportunities that exist. We are all aware that South Africa exports more than 200 million tons of dry bulk cargo uh, through its ports in Richards Bay, Saldana, Doha. Uh, of course, because, because of the current challenge, challenges in terms of uh, continuing uh, with that uh, part of our business. Nearly 100% decline in April, uh, especially on the new vehicle sales, uh, which has had an impact in terms of our export capability. Uh, we've seen that the export figures have had uh, some, some impact as well. The damage is believed to be permanent, uh, you know, because what we've lost, we are unable to recover uh, with speed that would require. We understand that these disruptions have had an impact in terms of uh, our own revenue uh, collection. Uh, we've had statements from our minister of, uh, it is anticipated that uh, almost uh, the 229 billion in customs tax revenue will reduce, that uh, our Deben Harbor has a significant impact to that. The loss of custom revenue will hit our fiscals and we've already experienced that. I've had an opportunity to engage with a few companies that are in the clearing and forging. Uh, all of them have said to me there's real challenges, especially those that uh, are smaller in size and those that are black empowered, uh, especially because most of companies have had to consider some who request their employees to take uh, extended leave, uh, especially during the complete lockdown, which was the stage five. And some of them, of course, to survive on the back of the the activities that have been taking place in other parts uh, of various ports in South Africa. But the Deben port has severely been affected, you know, purely because the, the oil uh, industry and the tank, uh, tank, uh, the tanker business has been heavily affected. Richards Bay has been uh, quite uh, uh, okay in terms of its operation, but we believe that uh, going forward, especially when we move to stage three, there's going to be a lot more activities. There's been challenges, especially with uh, 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 freight rates uh, in, within Transnet. Uh, there's not been enough trains that have been moving products uh, to the port, and that has had an impact, especially to the guys that are in the clearing and forging. The future remains uh, interesting. It is believed that probably between 20 and 30 percent uh, reduction uh, of that uh, uh, overall decline is anticipated going forward. In terms of the shipbuilding uh, and repairs, 
as we all know, there's not been any production uh, during between the March 27 and the 8th of May when the ports opened. That has had a significant impact uh, because there's not been activities. But I'm proud to say, especially the South Southern African uh, shipyards has not returned to nobody, uh, which is very encouraging. Uh, instead, they've uh, asked their employees uh, to consider as taking a, a leave during this period. The stipulation that companies must limit capacity to 50% of the, of the workforce is not really practically uh, feasible, especially uh, in a shipbuilding and ship repair business. But of course, uh, safety is the number one priority and it is uh, considered that uh, there will be uh, approaches to ensure that uh, the challenges uh, can be minimized in terms of safety and ensuring that the, the spread of COVID uh, does not go beyond, does not really affect the employees. According to the survey of the boat, South, uh, of the South African Boat Builders Export uh, Council uh, on the 6th of April, it is believed that shipbuilding companies have already begun uh, some retrenchments, uh, but it is encouraging that in our province, in KwaZulu Natal, we have not seen uh, much of that. The impact of COVID has also affected the oil and gas industry. It is believed that the world has returned to oil demand levels, which has last been seen in the 1990s. The world's top oil companies, as we all know, uh, on the 12th of April, they pulled off a historic cut in terms of their global production by nearly 10%, which has not happened uh, in many, many years. Uh, this is really worrying. The abrupt shutdowns partially damage all fields and restarting them once demand returns will take a lot longer. We are quite aware, especially in our South African, uh, South African, especially in KZN, there's a lot of exploration, there's anticipation of serious discoveries, especially on the oil and gas. We are aware that a company which is a joint venture between Sasol and Eni, they are doing exci exciting work in the province. And we understand that this COVID uh, may have an impact in terms of the long-term viability of some of the investment. But I'm encouraged that in my discussion with the CEO of Eni, uh, who gave me a commitment that the, their plans will remain uh, on track, uh, provided that the Department of Environmental Affairs uh, uh, sort out the, the issues uh, that have come up as part of the appeals in terms of the approved EIA that uh, was, was confirmed last year. The LNG investment remains very exciting. Uh, I've spoken to a lot of people that have an interest, especially in Richards Bay. Uh, all of them are saying to me they are still keen to continue uh, with some of their plans to invest uh, in the LNG uh, and uh, opportunities in Richards Bay. The impact on ports and terminals, uh, we've seen that cargo volumes have decreased sharply. Uh, tankers are mostly severely affected. We've also seen decreased consumption of energy fluids and dry bulk has been affected in respective terminals. Since borders are closed, crew changes are not really possible. So ships have to be deterred from calling in into various ports and that has a significant impact especially in terms of the maintenance of ships, uh, because as we know that 99% of uh, ships are not owned uh, in South Africa, uh, which is a huge uh, challenge uh, going forward. The impact on dry bulk market uh, has been very severe. Uh, we've now uh, seen that uh, there's forecast that the freight rate will fall uh, up to 23% uh, in, in, in this uh, quarter. Uh, however, supply side effect is expected to support freight in the second half of this year. So we remain very positive that the challenges we have are not permanent, uh, provided that the world is able to deal with the challenges uh, that COVID-19 uh, is posing uh, to our industry. There's a few proposals that uh, we are uh, socializing with government to see to it that there is a way we could deal with the challenges. We are very encouraged with the announcement by the president uh, that talked about the rapid reopening of the economy uh, and the plans of moving to stage three. Uh, we encourage uh, that decision and we also support the initiatives 
uh, of the Premier of KwaZulu Natal in terms of reopening the economy. We support the packages around the reduction in port duties, uh, which are being discussed uh, with Transnet more specifically. Uh, we are also encouraged with some initiatives that deal with credit management measures. And of course, the whole issue around how to ensure that we keep our employees uh, uh, employed even during these difficult times. We are calling on government to intensify a five-year shipbuilding program, which government has been talking about for many, many years. We think this is now the right time for this intensive uh, shipbuilding program to be implemented. There's a few examples uh, that have been uh, spoken about. There's plans for three patrol vessels uh, for the Navy that needs to be built. There's plans for 10 tugs for Transnet that needs to be built. There's plans for two protection vessels for fisheries that need to be built. There's plans for two dredges that needs to be built. And of course, there's plans for three research vessels that needs to be built by the Department of Environment, uh, uh, Environmental Affairs. So we are saying these initiatives must be done so that we can preserve jobs and continue to create an environment which is conducive for our maritime economy to remain uh, profitable and to continue to thrive. We are asking that there must be a fast track uh, approach in terms of ship repair program uh, in KwaZulu Natal, especially. We are aware that there's long overdue maintenance on various vessels uh, in the province, especially within Transnet. There's four, there's four vessels within the fisheries that requires uh, to be repaired. And I'm also aware that there are three uh, uh, Navy vessels that need to be repaired uh, with speed. We believe this initiative will ensure that we can retain jobs and actually bring more jobs into the industry. We are also calling that there has to be a fast track in the establishment of the South African shipping company. There's been a lot of talk about the South African shipping company. I'm very happy that in KwaZulu Natal, the province of KwaZulu Natal has agreed to champion this initiative so that we are able to have our own ship, ships in South Africa that are registered in South Africa and also that are operating from South Africa. There's a lot of support for this initiative, and I'm very proud of the initiatives by our MEC, uh, 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 MEC uh, Nomu Sadube, in terms of looking at this opportunity going forward. Uh, Transnet needs to consider uh, bringing on board a lot earlier the new, the second tipler uh, that they've been talking about. We think that will help in, in increasing the capacity uh, of the Richness Bay port, especially for the dry bulk. Uh, which has a significant economic impact uh, in, our, in our province, in KwaZulu Natal. We are also saying there has to be a fast track in the decision around the gas to power project uh, in Richards Bay. As a province, we are ready, we have the infrastructure. Uh, Transnet has come forward to support this initiative. We are asking the Department of Mineral Resources and Energy to really fast track this initiative because it brings uh, with, with itself a very significant investment of about 20 billion rand uh, in our economy in KwaZulu Natal. We are also saying that the refinery project uh, in the Richards Bay IGZ uh, has to be fast tracked. And I'm very pleased uh, with the work that the board of the Richards Bay IGZ has been doing uh, to facilitate this investment, which we believe is up to 160 billion. Uh, RAND's uh, investment uh, uh, to KwaZulu Natal. We are also asking that CGS must continue with all the work that it's doing in terms of various exploration as well as various surveys that they are doing in our waters because through that we can continue to support the industry and we can continue to see a lot of opportunities uh, being made available, especially to the students that have graduated uh, with degrees uh, in, in the maritime industry. And then, of course, we want to revisit the Operation Pakisa program, uh, which was started by our former president, Zuma. We think this program has a very significant role to play going forward. And I think we need to probably call for a task team that will see to it that this program can be revisited. The sulfur regulation should be delayed 
uh, the sulfur regulation by the IMO were meant or have been uh, started uh, on the 1st of January. We believe as a maritime industry that we need to delay the implementation of this regulation at least up until uh, uh, 2022 because we believe the impact of COVID is not going to disappear anytime soon. We believe it will be with us uh, going forward, especially in terms of uh, our freight business. The carbon tax uh, that was imposed to the South African mining industry, we believe it has to be suspended at least until 2022 because already the mining industry in South Africa is heavily impacted uh, by COVID. As we are all aware, during stage five, there was almost no production. Uh, during stage four, at least there is some production, uh, up to 50%. We don't believe that even during the stage three, most of the mines can be able to go back to 100% uh, to production. So we are saying that all elements that impact on pro profitability of the mining companies uh, will need to be uh, 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 delayed in order to allow the, the industry to recover and to continue uh, to do what it does best. The new mining charter regulations that requires South African owned ships to transport minerals must be enforced urgently because this will drive local ownership uh, of ships in South Africa. In my conclusion, uh, I want to emphasize that this year, uh, which is 2020, is not a normal year. You know, we must accept that there's a new normal. The only focus we must be looking at in the maritime industry is to survive and to preserve employment. That must be our number one priority. But in doing so, we need to do it responsibly and ensure that we prevent the spread of COVID-19 going forward. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Ndobo, for quite a, an informative uh, lecture. Uh, we see all of you um, that have joined us. Uh, we'll go to the questions and answer session now. Uh, firstly, starting by acknowledging all of those, all of you that have attended uh, this lecture. We really appreciate your time, taking your time from your uh, busy schedule to just sit in for lunchtime. Uh, to attend this lecture. Um, we have uh, Lonely Wang Obo who is saying uh, thank you, thank you for, for this lecture to Dr. Ngobo. Uh, but we also have a panelist member, uh, Mr. Vincent Zulu, who's going to be assisting us in answering uh, some of our questions. We have uh, some questions that have come through uh, from Lengi uh, Wengane, who is asking um, three questions. First question being, what systems are in place by Moses Kotane to ensure that collaboration, inclusion, and involvement of various stakeholders is, 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 is taken aboard? Um, how does Moses Kotane aim to align its requirements in terms of the projects uh, for the, 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 the students and qualifications, the masters and the PhD uh, students uh, qualifi uh, and qualifications? as well as related projects. And um, she's also asking, um, are there any programs in the pipeline that, uh, that are aimed at pushing and maximizing the complete maritime awareness and knowledge of the industry, of all, uh, of, all of, of the industry all over KZN? I think um, I will request U U Mr. Zulu to assist us and answer some of these questions. Um, I don't see any other questions. Uh, yeah, there, there are comments, uh, but I don't see further questions. I'll check some more. Whilst I'm checking, uh, Mr. Zulu, please, can you attend to the first questions? Thank you very much, uh, Sameen. And uh, in terms of the first question, uh, there are active programs, uh, collaborate with the various industry stakeholders. Uh, a case in point is this lecture that we have. We can you just get closer to your mic? We can hardly hear you. Uh, sorry about that. I'm saying uh, we, 
circulatory, it often uh, various stakeholders if necessary. And henceforth, this uh, lecture today is part of the effort in terms of reaching out to stakeholders and ensuring that uh, we, we move maritime in a manner whereby there is a greater collaboration. Uh, there are also, we have a, an active, uh, as, as part of our sub programs, advisory service where we engaging with the various stakeholders to ensure that uh, in, in certain instances, doing a, a, a practical or applied research, uh, and then sharing those among other platforms is the stakeholder fora that uh, Moses Kodani hold where all the stakeholders who are interested in that particular topic, uh, um, in that particular, uh, in that particular, in that particular sector uh, can meet. So we already engage with the stakeholders and it's an ongoing process. We've got some studies that are, are currently in place and as soon as uh, we are in a, a, a position to engage the stakeholders, we have uh, a great uh, And also, in terms of question uh, number two uh, about qualification, uh, we always have the view that we don't know what we can. We can right. hardly hear you, Mr. Zulu. Oh, I can hardly hear you. Uh, I'm in closer terms, to your mic, yeah. I'm much closer. I believe I'm much closer now. Are you able to hear me that better now? That's better. Yes. And then in terms of the second question on qualifications, our philosophy as Moses Kodani is that uh, you don't know what the bar, you raise people to reach the bar. As a result, we're funding a number of uh, uh, students who are doing postgraduate qualifications in, in, in maritime. So we're saying uh, where there are skills shortages, then we are able to fund and then we get the required uh, skill uh, as a result. Uh, and most, um, uh, uh, for, for example, we are busy now with the studies, a skills audit, and in terms of the skills audit, whatever the, uh, the outcomes uh, will be, we will then be able to fund uh, some of those programs. Uh, and then on the question of um, uh, awareness, the MKI's program 4.4 is about increasing ocean literacy uh, among the citizens and for the citizens to, uh, to uh, be more aware of the economic opportunities uh, in, in the maritime space. And we run a number of awareness programs, uh, lectures. We've done it at uh, various universities. We also do it in, uh, in some of the, the events that come, uh, like when there's World Maritime Event, we also hold uh, events to uh, to share more uh, information. We are currently busy on uh, the program for the World Oceans Day, which is celebrated annually on the 8th of June. And the theme for this year is innovation uh, for oceans uh, sustainability. Uh, most of this engagement we share on our various platforms and uh, we also reach out to various uh, communities and, and, and stakeholders. It is a very much an active program that uh, has no start uh, or end date, uh, and um, we reach out to the whole uh, to the whole province. And stakeholders are encouraged to uh, follow us on various uh, platforms, uh, and also if stakeholders have engagements where they believe we can be able to share our expertise, we are able to do so. Yeah, um, thank you so much. Uh, we have further questions. I think we still have a little bit of time. We can still take a few more questions. Otherwise, if we don't make it through to quarter to one, we, when we're supposed to end the lecture, I think we can uh, carry on with some of the answers um, offline. Um, we have a question from Togozani Kumete posed to the panelists, uh, posed to Dr. Ngobo and maybe and Mr. Zulu uh, is trying to gauge as to how soon uh, we can see a South African owned ship uh, becoming a reality. And um, we also um, have uh, Stephen uh, Geldenace who's saying, um, 
uh, Griffin has just uh, disappeared, but we also have um, a, a comment from Bega Zulu, uh, who's uh, Captain Zulu, we recognize you, who's saying that perhaps it's time for MKI to do an impact assessment on Operation Pakisa achievements uh, or achievements. Um, yeah, we have um, Mzueleni who's asking about the role of fast tracking local ownership uh, on oceans economy. There are quite a number of questions, uh, but I'll move over to the chats as well. Um, where Usanele Kumete is, uh, is having a question about, again, about the South African owned vessel. I think there's a need for ownership uh, in this space because most people are going on um, ownership, asking about questions of ownership. Perhaps let me pa pause there um, and we'll, uh, uh, let's get answers from the panel and then we'll move from there. Uh, over to you lecturers, starting with Dr. Ngobo. Yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, CEO. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you for the question to to everyone that she's uh, asked questions. And I want to acknowledge uh, Captain Zulu, uh, who's also asked a question. Uh, let me just uh, share a few uh, views, uh, especially from the question that's asked by Chogozani Kumete, in terms of uh, when exactly are we going to have uh, ships that are owned uh, by South Africans. Uh, this has been a big debate uh, for many years. Uh, I'm happy to say that the ruling party has taken a resolution that uh, local ownership of, of ships uh, needs to, to, to happen. And that has been translated to the mining charter uh, where the mining industry has been, uh, is now required uh, to procure services uh, of shipping uh, from the South African owned companies. Of course, there is uh, delays in the implementation of that requirement, but it is there. Uh, and we can only ask the Department uh, of Mineral Resources and Energy under the leadership uh, of Comrade uh, Gwete Mantash to really push hard uh, that uh, this section of the act uh, of the mining charter is, is fully implemented. But we must also acknowledge that there's a couple of mining companies that have adopted uh, this uh, clause in the mining charter of using South African owned uh, mining companies, uh, to, uh, sorry, shipping companies uh, to start moving their product. So we need to acknowledge that. Currently, as I said uh, in my presentation, 99% of the ships uh, are not owned in South Africa, uh, unfortunately. They are owned elsewhere, they are owned uh, in Greece, they are owned in Singapore, they are owned in China, they are owned elsewhere. There is a big drive, but the only time this could be possible, it's when there is cargo available that is dedicated uh, to be transported by the locally owned uh, shipping companies. That is why it is expected that through this mining charter requirement, uh, there will be pressure to the ship owners uh, to now register those vessels in South Africa and also to comply with the triple BE requirements in South Africa, which requires you to have, to have at least 30% local ownership. There is some strides. I know Anglo is, is passionate about uh, 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 using South African uh, own uh, ship uh, owners uh, in moving some of their products out of Saldana. Uh, I'm aware that uh, uh, Parabora Copper, a uh, PMC, uh, is, 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 is passionate. Uh, they are already using uh, South Africa Seaways uh, as the local empowerment uh, company that is 51% black owned and that is moving their product. So there is some progress, but it's not enough. So we all have a responsibility to, to work with our government uh, and ourselves as Moses Kontane, we will continue to drive uh, this area uh, together with SAMHSA and SAMHSA has done uh, excellent work but what is now required is that SAMHSA and the Department of Transport and the Department of Mineral Resources and Energy needs to come together to, to implement uh, what they've already uh, committed, which is the establishment 
of the South African uh, owned uh, shipping company. Uh, we believe that will uh, go a long way in ensuring that there's local uh, ownership. I'm also aware of a number of uh, ship owners around the world that have said, if government was to finalize this uh, setup of the South African uh, shipping company, they will make vessels available uh, as part of the fleet uh, for that program. I'm aware that has already made that commitment. Uh, I'm also aware that there's many other companies that are just waiting for government uh, to make a decision. When it comes to the Operation Pakisa, I think Captain Zulu, you are absolutely right. Uh, maybe this is something I need to discuss with our MEC, uh, that we should do an assessment of the impact uh, of the Operation Pakisa. When Operation Pakisa started, we were all excited, especially by the number of jobs that are associated uh, with the program, and also the investment, the foreign direct investment that was associated with it. We're very excited, and personally, you know, I was passionate, and I remain very passionate uh, you know, with, with that development. But it's something that I will take uh, forward with our MEC, and of course, uh, we have to work uh, with the Department of Transport and the Department of Environment, because those were the departments that were coordinating the Department of Operation Pakistan. Local ownership is possible, but we as the maritime professionals need to come together, but of course we need government to support us. And I must say that the programs that are driven by Moses Kotane Institute are geared to ensure and to facilitate partnerships uh, with the industry to ensure we can develop uh, a local ownership. There is some development. Uh, there's a few companies that have uh, 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 concluded various empowerment deals. It's not enough, and I think there's still opportunities to do more. Thank you, uh, Mr. Zulu. Yes, uh, thank you, Chair. Um, in terms of uh, uh, the, the relationship, there's a question on the relationship between uh, uh, AMSA and Moses Kotani. Uh, we are working on a number of programs, and Moses Kotani is a, a, a tasked with a coordinating and leading on maritime in the, in the province. So our role is to engage with um, various stakeholders in the sector. Some have been the uh, authority for maritime in South Africa, and they are, they are working very quickly uh, with that. And the, some of the programs, uh, in order for to achieve uh, inclusiveness in the sector, include uh, the work that we are doing on the, the rural maritime development strategy. Uh, we also working on the uh, coastal and marine tourism uh, 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 for rural and township uh, development. So all of these are to ensure uh, that at the end of the day, uh, when we talk about, uh, like one has alluded, the need for uh, uh, black people to be uh, to participate in the sector, increasing knowledge. We want to have a situation where you increase the knowledge about the sector, but you also open it up for inclusiveness. You've got uh, programs that are running in that space. And as Moses Kodani Institute, we've got, among others, the Maritime Incubation Program, the Maritime Accelerator Program, among the bigger uh, 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 enterprise development, which is a big a component of uh, what Moses Kodani does. And uh, uh, the purpose there is to ensure that uh, the aspirant entrepreneurs and uh, the fledging uh, entrepreneurs that are in the maritime space are given the necessary support uh, and uh, um, exposure into the sector so that at the end of the day we start to, uh, uh, to redress uh, the, the issues of ownership uh, in, in, in the various subsectors uh, within uh, uh, I mean within the, within the sector. And uh, uh, Captain Begas uh, will also implement uh, uh, in terms of the, 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 the Operation Pakista. Uh, we all of the view that, uh, as a, as a, especially as a province, we can do very uh, 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 much better than 
we currently are doing and we're looking at um, uh, the programs as I have alluded in Asian and others, so that we, whenever, wherever the bottlenecks is are, are, are addressed and we start to see the uh, 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 um, objective of uh, Operation Parking Star starting to Okay, um, thank you very much. Um, I don't think we have time for more questions, um, but I would like to thank you, uh, Mr. Zulu, for um, uh, assisting us with the questions. And then uh, a special thank you to uh, Dr. Ngobo, uh, who has delivered uh, this lecture. Uh, I think, Dr. Ngobo, perhaps you can avail the slides uh, on the MKI website. Uh, for, 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 for the attendees to, to view and maybe download. Um, um, I would like to thank all of the uh, attendees uh, uh, to this lecture and we really appreciate your time. Uh, it's clear that we need to engage more uh, on the maritime sector because there are more questions that came through, but because of time we were not able to answer. I think we have about 19 questions um, that are seated here which need to be answered uh, offline. So thank you very much uh, for, for attending. And at this point, I'd like to also uh, thank our support team uh, for this lecture, Steve Johnson, De Dennis Rose, uh, Zama, Damini, and Tafatwa Sajwayo. And thank you very much. Uh, goodbye. Okay, goodbye.